And speaking of which, Toronto is the best. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. It's uh, we're in the worst. We're the most locked down city, I think, in North America, possibly the world at this point. It's pretty hilarious. Um, what an honor. <laughs> it's been really, it's been really bad. Yeah, I'll try to like move over here. Um, yeah, so that's basically where we're at. And uh, I just took a nice hour long walk. Nothing's open. I went into like a kind of like a like kind of like a health food store and I just wanted to buy something. So I just bought like a bunch of matcha, which I never drink, but I'm going to start trying it because, you know, interesting new things. Yeah, I I think I feel like quarantine because I live in Los Angeles, which is also continuously one of the most locked down places. <laughs> Um, and although we're not obviously not doing nearly as well as our esteemed neighbors to the North, yeah, um, we, and we will never let you forget that either. So I, listen, it's your <laughs> right. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and I also have been trying new things, namely my mm -hmm. husband's French onion dip Yeah, that he makes from scratch. Incredible. Just and have you have you picked it up? Are you any good at it? No. <laughs> okay. Wow. And I, I think maybe I do it on purpose just so he'll make it. <laughs> like to be perfectly honest. Um, but it's interesting that like, have you tried a lot of like new stuff nutritionally that you wouldn't have otherwise? I've tried to cook new things. I've definitely tried to. Oh yeah, actually, this one thing that I started doing. I don't know if they have this in Los Angeles. I'm sure they do, but instead of like buying vegetables um, at the grocery store, I've just like, I've just like ordering boxes of vegetables and they never tell you, they don't tell you what's in it. They're just like, you get a box, it's gonna have like some root vegetables, some fruit, uh, some random lettuce, some tomatoes and a bunch of random stuff. And you're just gonna have to deal with it. I'm like, all right, <laughs> give it to me. What's like, the yeah. weirdest thing you've gotten? I got, I got parsnips. I've never eaten, <gasps> I've never bought parsnips before, but I can't, yes. they came. And I was like, what is this? And I had to like actually go back and check the list. I was like, oh, okay. And then, so I just cooked them like carrots. They were great. And so they, technically they are great, right? Yeah. Yes, they're amazing. I actually didn't real. So when I was growing up, um, my mom was uh, not the most creative food person. Um, okay. And she, it's like, you know, she's a mom, everybody in my family's working, she's busy. So I try not to sound too judgmental when I'm talking about it, yeah. but like her idea of a salad is definitely iceberg lettuce and like some carrot shavings, yeah. you know? And yeah. so I didn't have like a lot of vegetables. I didn't have a Brussels sprout. We didn't eat those. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I did not know parsnips existed until, I was living in Los Angeles and I was at a fancier friend's house and they are amazing cooks and they had made just a carrot parsnip dish. Like they just laid mm. them on a cookie sheet, put olive mm. oil and yep. put them in the oven. Simplest thing ever. Yeah. And then I was like a true believer. I was like, Jesus, there is an entire world of vegetables I know nothing about. Yeah. And they're mostly easy to cook too, right? Like that's not complicated. You put it on a cookie sheet, you put some uh, salt on it and you're good. You're good to you're go. You're done. You're good. Have yeah. you, have you ever had matcha before? Did you just buy it for fun? I've, I, I've had it before, I, but like I bought it for fun because I was like, it's one of those things. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to like it. It's one of those things you try it when it first becomes popular. Right. And you're like, I don't like this. And then you stop drinking it. And then years later, you're like, oh, I should try matcha. It wasn't that bad the first time around, was it? I'm pretty sure I'm not going to like it. But <laughs> I, I wanted to have something. I wanted to drink something at night that wasn't too caffeinated mm. so that I could sleep. And I, my friend drinks it all the time. So I think he kind of got me into it. Um, so I'm like, OK, I'm going to give this another shot because it's, you know, it's healthy-ish and for meditation and whatnot. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to I... give it another shot. I think the matcha thing, like if you dig it, my yeah. impression of matcha is that like once you decide that you like it, it becomes like a <laughs> cult that you belong to. And then right. all of a sudden you're like whisking things and you have like that stone. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to get, my friend has the stone and I'm like, I don't want to get <laughs> that deep into it, man. Like just, it's fine. I have like, it's, I'm, I'm just a light matcha user, um, but maybe- <laughs> 
but you're right. Maybe it's like, like an all or nothing kind of thing. So maybe in a week I will have the stone and like have the whisk, which my friend has definitely. The right. So we'll we're we'll have this. We'll revisit this conversation somehow, and then I'm gonna find out because yeah. I am scared to try it again because the first time that I tried it, I thought it tasted like green dirt. <laughs> and i was you, like this is bullshit i do not want to drink this <laughs> yeah and then someone's like you weren't whisking it properly or you weren't doing it right like yeah yeah, yeah. I'm like, I, man because <laughs> i mean i think i definitely look like someone that should drink matcha sure yeah definitely like and i, I mean, live in los not, angeles not to, stere- not, to stere- not to stereotype but yeah i mean if you live in los angeles <laughs> yeah <laughs> You're familiar with it, yes. I feel like I like I like let's say that some of the people that I grew up with, if I said the word matcha, they yeah. would go, bless you. Mm. <laughs> and so <laughs> I definitely like I pick up that title proudly as like a pink haired Angelino now. So yeah. How yeah. so what have you during quarantine being locked down, have you been having like a whole bunch of filmmaking ideas popping are you working on um, things I definitely was working a lot as it just turns out once you close the bars I'm just like incredibly productive I don't know <laughs> I can't I can't really explain it but like as soon as they were gone I was like wow I can just think clearly all the time this is strange um <laughs> so I I've definitely been more productive I've been writing a lot um I decided to take February well I knew I was going to be promoting the movie in February so I kind of like took writing off of February but um but yeah, it's been, it's been really productive. But like, the thing is like every, everything slowed down. So if you're trying to get something made or if you're trying to like get people to develop stuff, like everyone's like, well, we're, we're all just, we're all just sitting on our ass until like production opens again, which is understandable. Um, so I, I do wonder if there's going to be like this whole backlog of, pe- of like these pandemic scripts that people writ- wrote. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I've been working on stuff and um, it's been really, it's been going really well. And I, I, a part of me was like, I better like write all this stuff and make sure all these scripts are good now. Cause once the bar is open again, I'm just going to be a monster for like four months straight <laughs> and like exactly. nothing's going to get, do- nothing's going to get done. Yeah. I, I keep thinking, cause it's the same with my ideas because I'm out there like trying to pitch TV shows, seeing what things I can host. And I feel like I haven't, uh, I'm getting that little voice in my head. That's like, we're coming to the end of this thing yeah. and you haven't really accomplished much, but <laughs> you have like, you've, you've enjoyed French onion dip. <gasps> yeah. You've and enjoyed you've, a lot of French onion dip. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, but other than that, and, and so it's, then I, then the other voice comes in the one that's trying to protect me and is like, just surviving is good enough. <laughs> I, I was going to say the exact same thing. Like once in a while you do feel that you haven't done enough and then you go on Instagram and there's usually one of those things oh. or like Twitter or someone's like, you yeah. know what, just surviving this thing is like a massive achievement. I'm like, you know what? That guy's right. You know, I like <laughs> yeah. that. I like that post. Like, great. Right. And I'll just like... And then I'm like, great. So what's on TV? Like, should I just watch basketball for the rest of the night? Sounds great. I'll just do that because I am surviving. I am in survival mode right now. So this is, I feel like this is, it's, it's a great, in in one, in a certain way, it's a great time to release a movie because people are very open and they really want to see stuff that they might not have, they might've missed any other time yeah. honestly yeah and because i i have people i think that's the number one question that i get all the time is like there's so many things there's a lot of choices but we're missing our blockbusters so what should i check out and so mm. for an independent cinema lover such as myself yeah. i'm like ooh, i have so many yeah. recommendations yeah and the thing that i loved about your movie specifically a couple of things that really leapt out at me i thought your cast was sensational which is a testament to them but also to you because i was like damn if i don't believe that this whole thing is true (laughs) yeah and also i would i would like to say testament to canada is all canadian cast so that was i was really proud of that um yeah but thank you very much i thought they all did incredibly well there i i'm especially sensitive to I, the reason I don't act, let me say it this way. The reason that I don't act is because 
I don't have a lot of experience. And I think that when I see myself in a finished product, it sounds false. Like it sounds like I memorized a line and I said it. And then, um, so I kind of, I'm always watching for that in movies. And I'm like, oh, I check out so fast of a, from a movie if it feels that way to me. If I feel like, Jesus, I could have been in this movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I thought your cast was exceptional. I love, and, yeah. and also when I heard that, when I first heard the mention of Canada in it, I was like, yay, it's Canada. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and- the, the movie, the most Canadian part of the movie is that like everyone talks about America as this other thing. Um, <laughs> and um, one of my friends, one of my closest friends, he's American. I sent him the movie in a very early version of it. And he, the first thing he said was like, I liked it, but there was one thing that stuck out to me. How come everyone in the movie shits on America, but also everyone in the movie wants to work in America? Don't you think that's like a contradiction? Like that's pretty inconsistent. And I said, no, that's actually being Canadian. That's the most <laughs> Canadian thing you can do. Is you gotta hate America, but you kind of gotta envy it at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, again, I just bring it back to being Canadian and whatnot. And yes, I'm also very yay Canada. I really wanted this to like be a Canadian movie and have a Canadian perspective. And part of that is, you know, sort of standing next to this like 300 pound monster of a country that just dominates the headlines constantly, culturally and economically and politically. So why don't you go ahead and explain the film in your own words to anybody that hasn't seen it yet? Uh, Cause I, I, I always love asking that question because I know what log line I have in my head, but I want to hear yours. <laughs> Um, the movie is about uh, a young Asian Canadian, like computer science student. She's a she's a brilliant student. She already has a job lined up in Silicon Valley, where she got already got hired um, out of from Canada. And the week before that, she's about to graduate and get her diploma, she gets dragged into an academic tribunal for allegedly plagiarizing her final history essay. And even in computer science, I don't know if this is colleges are like this in America, but even if you major in computer science, they force you to take a number of uh, liberal arts classes which she did not want to do, but she did. And so she, she was, she's accused of be plagiarizing this history essay. And the whole movie is essentially a trial to figure out whether she did it or not. And it's run very much like a trial. It's called an academic tribunal. Um, and they, they actually have these in universities. And uh, yeah, it's essentially a courtroom drama about cheating on an essay. And I love how during the film, it's acknowledged several times that while this is being treated very much as a courtroom <laughs> yeah. trial, that it is yeah. absolutely not. <laughs> it's, not, it's not. It's not. That's like my favorite. It's like one of. The, it's like the funniest thing to me. Like people in a room, like pretending to do something that they sort of know how to do from TV, and they're like, "But like, th- there's no law. It's technically not against the law to cheat on an essay. It's against the university rules, but that's not the law." And so they're trying to run this trial with judges and lawyers and witnesses, but like no one has any idea what they're doing, um, which I just think is such a funny situation. And, and that's kind of what drew me to the story in the first place. And I, uh, and I especially love April's roommate. She is my favorite yeah. person. <laughs> and right. yeah. <laughs> I, so for everybody watching, that's, that's like my favorite part where I went, I went, oh, sick <laughs> Canadian burn. Like, yes, thank you. She, yes. April's roommate comes in as a, uh, as a witness, I suppose, to testify on her behalf. And then uh, things basically go off the rails, as they do for most of the movie. Um, and once again, I, I know that a lot of the log lines are, uh, the, mo- the trailer makes it seem like it's a very serious movie. And it is. It's about things like race and gender and power dynamics and, and um, the importance of academics, but I always had it as a comedy first in my head. All those other issues sort of came from me as well, but like, I always wanted it to be funny, first and foremost, funny before anything. So I just wanted to stress that point. And I hope you thought it was funny as well, which you yeah. seem like you did. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely <laughs> did. And there were parts of it where it, it was a kind of, I do a lot of yelling at the television, like, sure. <laughs> So I, yeah, it's a lot of like, oh, what? Yeah. Like a lot of that. Because movies like this are all about, uh, to me, in my in my viewing of it, it's all about, did well, did she or didn't she? And the ride that you take to getting there is what makes it fun. And I really loved how your actress, it's Celine Tsai, right? 
Yep, Celine Sun. And I I love how she played it. Um, and I wanted to talk with you about casting her and what that process was like because I thought that she nailed the important ambiguities throughout the movie that really made yeah. me guess for the whole film. Yeah. Um, casting Celine was a process because that was one of the parts where we didn't just offer it to an actor that that we thought was right. Um, there was there wasn't a lot of Asian actresses in Toronto, but we we auditioned, I think all of them, and they all came in and they were all great. But I was looking for something that, like you mentioned, or I think something that perhaps you're alluding to, like someone who has a sense of mystery to them, but also like a sense of like scariness, I suppose. And, you know, I really wanted someone who could play both sides, who could be both innocent and like kind of threatening at the same time. And Celine was the only one who came in who I was genuinely afraid of her. Like when she did her performance, I was like, oh man, this, this girl might stab me. Like, I, I think this is the right one. And like the other, the, everyone else is great, but like, I didn't feel threatened by them. I was like, ah, she's not really going to stab me. Like she's just faking it. But, but Celine, I actually felt like she might stab me. So I, I, I wanted, and I knew that she could do the other side of it, the, the super innocent side of it as well. Um, so that's how, uh, that's how I ended up with Celine, basically the, the actor who scared me the most during the auditions. I get that from her performance. And so I totally understand why you would say that. And I'm like, yeah, that's the girl where you're like, maybe, or maybe not. This is how this <laughs> yeah. is going to turn out. Um, yeah. did you do any kind of chemistry reads because April is going up against Keith yes. and like head to head and, yeah. uh, and Jonathan K Kites or Keats? Kel Kelts, Kelts. Oh, Kelts, excuse me. See, yes, there we go. That's right. That's so did you do any reads between the two of them to make sure that they matched? Um, shockingly, no. Jonathan Kelts was the, uh, he was the most experienced actor. He's been on the TV show Rain for many, many seasons. He's been in ah. uh, 21 and over. He's been in many movies. And um, he, I knew him through a friend. So I just offered him the part because I knew he was right for it. But he was in Los Angeles at the time when I offered it to him. So I didn't even really hear him read the lines. And I, and the first time that they, Jonathan and Celine were in the same room was like the day we were shooting basically. And wow. they immediately, yeah, they immediately like went at each other. Um, and they just fell into place very naturally. And I, I, you're not the first person to mention how great they were together as, as opposing forces. And I, I've looked back throughout the years because it's been years since we filmed this. And I was like, wow, I was really lucky that that happened. Like that doesn't, naturally just fall into place so so perfectly the way that it did and it's a testament to the actors and how how great they were how they both knew what the right mode of of what they wanted to do was as soon as they saw each other so i i didn't have anything to do with that i just like oh yeah these two people would be good and then uh the extra magic that came that was all them that with each other when you were writing this did you think about how it is essentially like a location manager's dream in that it only has one main set and then just a couple of satellite, you know, extra locations. Was that, was yeah. that specifically a choice? It was, it was a definite hundred percent a choice. Um, you know, they, a lot of beginner filmmaker advice is always like, if you can write a movie in one room and, you know, eventually, and I think there's an in amount of ideas but some of a lot of them get used um and i watched this israeli movie called get g-e-t-t -T, which was also set in one room it was a courtroom setting and it was about a woman trying to get a divorce and through this one room they were able to ring out so much comedy so much drama so much like political commentary and have big questions about like what does faith mean what does it mean to be a good husband what does it mean to be a good wife and what does it mean to have children in a mar in a loveless marriage and I just was so impressed with how they were able to talk about so many things without leaving that one room. So I thought if I was going to make a first movie that I want, where I want to talk about all these things, a bunch of things that mattered to me, um, I should use this story format. And so obviously I don't know anything about a Jewish divorce or anything like that. So I had to think of my own courtroom setting um, that would work. And, and I remember I went to law school and I remember these tribunals or whispers of these academic tribunals and you know they were always a very hush hush shameful thing in in universities it seemed to me and so obviously that made me want to pursue it more so I did some more research I found out how they were run generally 
And then I sort of like, you know, wrote a script and I, I, I workshopped it with some academics and they were like, yeah, this can be right. And I'm like, okay, that's good enough for me. That's all I need. And, um, <laughs> and basically that's, that's how I, that's how I ended up with the final product. But yes, it did start with, you know, if you want to make a movie cheaply, don't leave one room as much as you can. Um, and that's where it started. Right. Yeah. And also try not to involve any children, any animals. No cats. Know. Yeah, no cars that transform into robots that fight each other, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I When I was thinking about the script, I wondered, like, you said that you needed to do research on an academic tribunal, so you'd never participated in one, thank God. But did no. you ever get in trouble in school? Like, even for something I, I, dumb. I never, I never got caught for it, but I've, I think I've, I've written like a few essays for money. Um, cause I was a pretty good writer in university and like, you know, some people needed some services. Um, but yeah, I, I did do, I did do that, you know, on the side for a little bit and, um, yeah, but I never got caught, which is great. Um, other than that, no, I never, I never really, I was a good student. I was a good kid. I was, to, I was, uh, you know, like a good Asian kid who was going to be a lawyer. And then I discovered I was not good at being a lawyer. And then I decided to go be a filmmaker instead. How'd that go over that decision? Being a lawyer? Oh, that decision? I mean, like, <laughs> my mom was like, wait, so you went to three years of law school and now you're just not going to be a lawyer. And I'm like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, as soon as I made the decision in my head, I, I felt much better. And I felt like, uh, of the weight of being a lawyer, which I was, again, not very good at, uh, was lifted off of me and I could go, you know, go do this other thing that brought me a lot more joy and satisfaction in my life. Yeah, it's, I don't, I don't have any kids. So it's, it seems terrifying to me that you sort of like have this little tiny human and then you raise them as best you can and you give them all these hopefully good habits and you hope, hoping that they succeed academically and in life, whatever. But then they throw you for a loop inevitably because they're just a person. Yeah. And, and they, they it, go do their own thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's inevitable. And it's like, you can either be, you can either be happy or you can be super mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. About the choice, but it seems terrifying to me now that I'm certainly closer to being on the parent side of the equation. Because, right. like I, when I went to school, I really didn't know what I wanted to major in, but then I realized I was looking at like a pamphlet, and I realized that everything I did was in the College of Communication. Yeah. So it's like journalism, writing, filmmaking, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, so I was like, I don't know. I'm just going to major in film. Yeah. And my parents were like, okay, do you have <laughs> like a plan B? And I, my plan B at the time was, oh, I'll just be a publicist. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> easiest thing in the world. <laughs> and then I, now that yeah. I am, uh, you know, essentially working as a journalist and am, dealing with publicists all the time. I'm like, what yeah. about me thought that I could do that job? Like I knew <laughs> nothing. It's dumb stuff that yeah. kids say, but yeah. I, I, I didn't get in trouble either though. I got suspended no. one time in like eighth grade. And then other than that, smooth yeah. sailing, smooth sailing. Gosh. but how, how much was an essay from you? That's important. Oh man. You know what? I should have charged more. I remember <laughs> specifically I remember specifically, this was years ago, but I, I took like 70 Canadian dollars and I, it only took me one night, but I think, I think if you parcel out the number of hours I've worked on, I was like less than minimum wage, but <laughs> I, for some reason, like when I was like 18 or 19, like $70 just seemed like a lot of money to me. And I guess it was, and like, I, it was for a class that I didn't know anything about. It was a history class, but the topic that I didn't know anything about. And I had like one night to do it and it was higher than the grade that I was in. I was like in first year and, um, oh. and I, and I got a B plus on it. So I was very proud of myself for like nailing it for this other person who will go unnamed. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Hot damn. Yeah, That's yeah. A, I, I think that when you're dealing with kids that age though, that is like, I wonder, I wonder if anybody would argue you should have raised your prices. Cause that seems I, relatively I, reasonable. 
it, it just seemed like so much money at the time. It's like funny, I just, right? I don't, yeah. And like, I think the, the other person was like a student as well. So I, I knew yeah. that they didn't, they weren't exactly rolling in it. Right. So I, you know, <laughs> it seemed fair at the time. <laughs> Although now that I think about it, I, I probably wasn't, but yeah, but that's yeah, how yeah. much it was. Yeah. Um, I'm fascinated by that because I now I'm thinking like, Jesus, I could have made a lot more money in college probably because I was pretty good at writing stuff. Well, I mean, in the movie, another witness that does come in is a professional uh, essay writer, essentially for uh, like someone who did what I did, but much more professionally. And these people exist in real life right now. Um, you can hire them. And I had to, I talked to one of them uh, again, for research to see like what their vibe was, what their process was, how they go about to not getting caught. Um, and some of that information ends up in the movie as well. But th that job is still, it's still around. And um, and one thing that the guy told me was like, um, uh, their most popular clientele are nursing students. So, you know, that's, I mean, I, I don't know why. I mean, listen, nurses should not sp be spending their time maybe writing political science essays. They should me maybe focus more on the medical side of things. So Ooh, that's yeah, what it's I like, remember. We need our medical professionals to just be focusing on like uh, medical knowledge. Like you, I don't care what they think about political science. Like sure, well-rounded yeah. people are great. But I mean, it's like, can you put on a bandage properly? Exactly, exactly. And I think that's what many of the nursing students think as well. They're like, you know what, right. I should not be wasting my time on this. So that was very illuminating to uh, talk to that professional cheater, I guess. Yeah. That was also one of the characters. I won't spoil it, but that yeah. character in the film is one of them that made me yell out loud as well. Yeah. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. definitely. Um, so the, the cinematography in this is so lush. I just, I love how it looked. And oh, I thought that that room that you chose to have most of the movie in was, it was a really good choice. You made the most Thank of it. You. It was gorgeous with the color. And so yeah. can you talk about working with Jackie and Chen and kind of coming up with that visual? Um, Jackie and Chen is a very talented, he's the cinematographer of the movie. He's super talented. And like, I gotta be honest with you, I'm not a big cinematography leaning director. I, I lean more on writing and story and acting. Um, so when it came to the cinematography, I, I just gave him a bunch of movies that I wanted it to look like. And, and he was, he looked at them and he was like, oh, okay, I, I see what you want. And then he basically made it happen. Um, I think one of the movies that I gave him was Mulholland Drive, which is, you know, one of my Ooh. favorites. And I said, I wanted it to have this sort of sense of uneasiness about it. Um, you know, just like, I, I, I can't remember exactly what the direction was, but I, I wanted it to feel sort of just like not quite right. Um, but it feels like it's in the normal world, but also it feels separate from the normal world. Um, and I, again, I'm not sure what his creative process is, but all I know is at the end of the day, he showed up with the lenses and the, the camera settings, and um, and that room again did did a lot of did a lot of the good work as well. Um, but yeah, that that's basically how I how I worked with Jackie Ann Chen. And you know, I I feel it's it's interesting that you'd bring up Mulholland Drive because I remember it in broad strokes and it almost seems like the color palettes are the same yeah it's kind of a little bit muted yeah yeah, yeah and it's sort of it's sort of, it's <laughs> this is weird but I the minute you said that I was like it's very like teal like yeah. rich blues <laughs> and sort of the and, yeah. and that's how I saw the movie as well so he nailed it how did you get connected with him um, I think we just, I think my producer and I just put out a search for cinematographers. I talked to a bunch of them. There's a lot, so many talented ones in Toronto, but the thing that drew me to Jack was he's also um, a Chinese Canadian and he really connected to the story in a way that, that, you know, uh, someone with a different background and a different upbringing probably wouldn't have been able to. Jack really understood, understood what the struggle was for the central character. Um, he understood that it was her story, that it was the Asian person's story. And I think the cinematography, the way that he shoots her, the attention that's paid to Celine as opposed to the, the Caucasian character is something that that only he could have brought to this project. And so, yeah, and, and I realized that he really understood the script on a level that I needed him to. And that's why I, I went with him in the end. And the camera definitely loves Celine. It sure. does, I mean, it really does. Although that's, I mean, I think she would have, she would have, 
look great under anyone, but yes, I think uh, yeah. the camera loves Selene, <laughs> that's for sure. What is, in a movie like this that's so economically done, what was the thing that was most surprisingly difficult for you during production? Oh man, it's, it's really, it, it was surprisingly difficult. You know, I've shot lots of things before, but I never had that many actors who each had their own individual roles. Like usually you have two main actor and then like a bunch of background or something, right? But like every character in this movie, I tried to give them their own backstory, their own sense of importance in the story. Um, and I think that that drew a lot of actors to it. They're like, oh, this is not just like a one dimensional character. I get to say these things, I have to, these opinions. But to have that many of them in a room at the same time, each with their own sort of agendas um, was very, that was new to me because, because I had to be very clear about whose scene it was at any given moment. Um, and that was, um, that was just something that I didn't expect to, I don't know, I, it was just something that, I, it was hard to think about that many people at the same time, I guess. Is sure. What I'm yeah. Yeah, exactly. I can, I, that's a great point, actually, because I, as I go through the cast mentally in my head, I'm like, yeah, we got something about everybody. Yeah. And the majority of them made me really mad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, again, with usually a scene, it's like one person talking to another person. It's just like two people's motivations, but with, with seven people in the room and everyone's reaction has to be worth something. So I have to go talk to each of them and just be like, okay, this is how you're reacting to what's being said. And, and when you say this, like, it, like everything's just happening all at once, which was something that I, I really didn't anticipate how hard that would be. Um, as opposed to just thinking about two main actors in, in the same room. So yeah, that was that was surprising to me. And then conversely, on the other side, as we wrap up, is there a thing that when you were watching the movie back that just kind of blew your mind that you captured that particular thing? <laughs> well, um, I, 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 not necessarily watching it back, but like as it was being filmed, does that count? Because I do have a yes. good story. I do have a good story about something that, blew my mind, it, it goes to essentially the joy of this job, which is watching other creative, passionate people sort of translate your, you know, weird ideas into something that's tangible. And we were shooting a scene. Um, it was a flashback scene to when the lead character is supposed to be much more, I guess, innocent and naive. And um, so it goes back like two years or something, right? And so she needed to look innocent and naive. And that was basically the direction I gave the makeup and hair person. I was like, hey, she needs to look innocent and naive in this in the scene, cool? And the makeup person's like, got it, right? And then Celine shows up and we start shooting the scene. Um, and, and as we're shooting it, I turn to the makeup person, I say, uh, Melanie Quigg, and I say, man, she looks really innocent and naive. Like she has no idea what's going on. Like, I don't know what you did, but good job. And Melanie says to me, oh, you know what I did? I gave her a, a center part, which really screams, I have no idea what's going on in the world. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I see, I see it now. It's a center part. Yeah, she looks like she's no idea what's happening in this room right now. Um, and I just laugh at that because I wouldn't have never come up with that idea. But it was a real, it was a real life decision by the makeup person in and it was a translation of just an idea that I had in my head. So stuff like that would always happen with every department. It always blew me away as to how like this thing, just like an idea would turn into an actual real life um, manifestation by, by the creative people around me. Absolutely. That's such a great, I, I mean, I, I want to say trick, but that almost cheapens it, you yeah. know, cause I mean, it, let's call it movie magic instead. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was movie magic. And it's always the people it's like everyone except for me, right? Like I just like have a lot of opinions <laughs> on like how this should look, this should look very scary and dramatic. And then everyone else has to figure out how to do that. Um, and it would always turn out in a way in which they were all they were exactly correct. But like, they would do things that I would never think of, um, which which was always very, uh, a very satisfying and joyful thing for me to see. Awesome. And for the audience, also satisfying and joyful and great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And I, like it's I said, so I am going to check up on, you know, the matcha situation. <laughs> the matcha thing. I'm going to have some right now, actually. I'll have some.